Hi, I'm Jack Howell. I'm sure most of you recognize the opening to Schubert's Der Hirt auf dem Felsen, or Shepherd on the Rock, for soprano and piano with clarinet obligato. It's one of the most beautiful things ever written for clarinet, and uh, for the most part, Schubert lobbed us a softball. Uh, we have to go over the break, but, but we go down and back up a C major arpeggio to the second register G, one of the sweetest notes on the horn. But what if we drop it a half step? Now we're in B major, and we're starting on a D sharp, which likes to be sharp, which is inconvenient because it's a third. And we go down through the throat F sharp, which likes to be flat, which is inconvenient because it's the fifth. Uh, and we go back up to the second register F sharp, which is most easily fingered with the middle finger because we've got the D sharp. Um, and it's not nearly as nice a note as the G. It tends to be a little thin and whiny in comparison. Uh, we could finger it with a sliver key, which would be a better timbre, but it wouldn't really be worth the risk to slide back to the D sharp. So we have to color the, the forked F sharp. Now, how about we play it in B flat? Okay, we've got a nice second register F to, to go to. And the D is pretty stable, but we have to deal with the throat B-flat. And also the, the typically flat throat F is a fifth. Well, why are you doing this? You might ask. You know, why would you play Shepherd on the Rock in such a wretched key as B major? Well, that's the point of a tone study, to discover and solve these issues of tone and intonation. That's exactly the point, or one of the points. Um, a tone study is a short melody that we play in all keys, or at least several of them, for the express purpose of unifying our tone using our best notes and registers as a benchmark to improve the notes and registers that are not quite as good. Years ago, when I was principal in the New Mexico Symphony, um, I noticed that the principal flutist at the time, Bob Bush, would often warm up by playing these longish legato tunes. Uh, and then he would play the same thing a half step lower, and then, then a key the half step lower. I, when I asked him what he was doing, he said, uh, it's a Moise tone study. I was inquisitive. Uh, Bob, who studied with Trevor Y, who studied with Marcel Moise, who is to flutists as Daniel Benat is to clarinetists, or as oboists is, or is to Marcel Tabito, um, explained, Bob explained, forgive the parenthesis, explained that uh, Moise taught that a tone's beauty is best judged in the context of a phrase. One beautiful note is of little use if it cannot be seamlessly connected to other notes, if its timbre is not equalized with its neighbors, if it is not colored and intonated and intentionally placed dynamically and rhythmically within a phrase. Therefore, tone should be studied and developed as indivisible from musical ideas. Not every note on the flute or the clarinet is equally strong in the same way. Some notes are more brilliant than others and need to be covered in order to fit in a phrase. Other notes are more pale and need to be enriched. As an idea changes key, the function and intonation of each note in the phrase changes. And a note on the instrument that might have been perfectly intonated and colored in one key will need to be altered according to its function in another key. And I'm working on an intonation video, but we'll just leave that one right there for now. So, back to Bob and the Moise Tone Study. That was an aha moment for me. I was, I don't know, 25, 26, and I had played hundreds of hours of long tones trying to develop a beautiful tone, and I'd done my very best to play phrases beautifully and in tune as they were written, but it, it, it never occurred to me to take a musical idea out of its key and use it to measure and strengthen my tone. 
I had, however, recently completed a master's degree with an arts management emphasis, and my business classes had made me alert to the classic mistake of hoping for A while rewarding for B. For more on that, Google the Cobra effect. Playing long tones in isolation and hoping that the resulting tone will somehow install itself in everything we play may work, but then again, it may not. I've certainly heard plenty of players who could play a beautiful steady tone, but whose tone became unpleasant in technical or articulated passages or at dynamic extremes. So I started practicing and teaching tone studies. Um, I found Moise's examples, even his little 20, his 24 little melodic studies, I found those to be a little too long and unfamiliar. I found myself spending too much attention on transposition uh, to get what I wanted to get from the exercise. Maybe that was my shortcoming, but I think it's like athletic training. Uh, an athlete beginning weight training will start with exercises that are simple and with weights that are light so that the form can be strictly controlled. Going straight to a max clean and jerk is unlikely to be beneficial. So, to me, a good tone study is, first, beautiful. Uh, and it's established in the repertoire. We, we all know how, what, it, what it is, what it sounds like. Second thing is that it is harmonically comprehensible to the player. Not all players are alike or equal in their harmonic comprehension, but we need to be able to know what we're playing in order to concentrate on the pitches and concentrate on the intervals. Third, I think it should express a musical idea. It should express a mood. It should express a character. It should be something that we can use in music. And while I have no shortage of suggestions, and I'll often assign a, a specific tone study to a student for a particular issue, I encourage, encourage students to discover their own tone studies and bring them to lessons so we can examine them together. For ease of transposition, we start simple, but that doesn't mean, simple does not mean superficial. As we discuss how the various notes of the melody function in the key and how musical character is derived, the student acquires a musical vocabulary. Each musical idea that is examined, considered, refined, and polished becomes a template for similar phrases. As Marcel Moise says in his book On Sonority, quote, the student will then be in a position to apply this method to a good many pieces and will find the method more beneficial than the sort of premature instinctual interpretation that the mind often later finds dissatisfying, but by then can no longer be changed. Was there ever a nail more squarely struck on the head? Um, identifying a musical idea, internalizing it, and then using it to create the most beautiful tone possible in every key is, I believe, a real shortcut to artistic playing. Now, don't be intimidated by transposition. You already, I hope, play scales. You begin by hearing the tunes in your scales. Here's one of my favorite tone studies just to illustrate the point, it's the horn solo that begins the finale in Stravinsky's Firebird. It's beautiful. It's comprehensible. It uses only the first five notes of a major scale beginning on the fifth. Um, if you can play major scale, you can play this solo as a tone study in any key and start reaping benefits. As we play the solo, we feel the serenity of the break of dawn in the ballet, following the evil Kashke's death and preceding the general rejoicing of his freed subjects. As we play, we strive for the same sort of tangent to a circle attack that a great principal horn achieves. We strive for the same absolute equality of timbre note to note. 
which becomes increasingly difficult as we cross registers. Even going from the right hand to the left in the second register presents small differences in color that we must correct and we strive for absolutely liquid legato articulation within the phrase. Again, with our principal horn as, as our model. The variety of, of musical concepts that can be explored in this way is limited only by the imagination. Articulation, time signatures, wide melodic leaps. Let's say we want to explore using our best possible tone in a heroic bravura character. That's another one of my favorites. Staying with Beethoven, let's say we want to work on tone in the context of a melodic, clear artic articulation. Here's another nice one. could go on, but you get the point. The tone study, uh, we play musical ideas rather than notes. We hear and intonate in a key. We strive for everything we should while playing music, for beautiful tone, clean attacks and releases, intentional dynamics and phrasing. We recognize the demands of music instead of imposing our limitations on it. I think of the tone study a little like hunting agates on the beach with my father as a child. These like, were cold, gravelly Pacific Northwest beaches, and as we hiked, we occasionally would find these agates, these translucent, amber-colored stones among the millions of dull gray stones. They would glow in the sunlight, and we would pick them up and hold them and admire them, turning them this way and that in the light, before we would put them in our pockets and take them home and uh, polish them up in the rock tumbler. Mike Krusenik once told me that Philadelphia Orchestra principal bassoonist Danny Matsukawa said that the secret to winning auditions is to have a pocket full of colors. I like that. If you found this video helpful, please consider mashing that subscribe button. Go get them.